Great to see uh, all the Global Grizzlies are over here. Do you know about that group? Um, they're a wonderful group of students who uh, many are pre-med, but not all. And they go to a different country, usually in Africa, every summer um, and contribute their skills. This year they're going to Uganda and uh, they've been faithful attendees at the lecture series. Sydney, did you bring those sign-up sheets? I did, they're in the back. They're in the back. You don't get to sign up. And the other thing I wanted to note for you is you can turn your papers in any time, all right? You don't have to wait until the end. I, I like to have them, actually, as we go along. Um, so remember, it's a one-pager. you got to do two of the lectures um, this, this uh, lecture series. Um, well, thank you all for coming out uh, in competition with the uh, Elton John concert. Uh, I'm sure that was a big sacrifice for you, but you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, so tonight we have Heidi Halverson. And she's going to be talking about dental hygiene work in rural settings. Heidi started her public health work in Bethel, uh, Arkansas, as a dental disease prevention supervisor. And for Bethel and, well, that's Alaska, isn't it? Correct. <laughs> Alaska, OK. And 48 Eskimo villages. I didn't think there were any Eskimo villages. <laughs> After two years there, she joined the Peace Corps as a public health dental hygienist in the country of Jamaica. So she's, I think, the third speaker who was in the Peace Corps this session. And we got one more coming for sure, because she, because Tenley Snow was the Peace Corps oh, recruiter on campus here. Um, and so Heidi currently works three days in a traditional dental office in Missoula. But she also works two to three days providing dental hygiene services individuals in long-term care and assisted living facilities. Interesting, isn't it? We we're just talking about long-term care and assisted living in my class today, right? I mean, yeah. um, she volunteers in the community with Project Homeless Connect, Back to School Bash, <coughs> and she is on the Maternal Child Health Advisory Council and the Community Health Improvement Plan Committee. So as you can tell, she's uh, definitely eminently qualified to talk to us tonight. So welcome. Please join me in welcoming Heidi to the lecture series. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for everyone to come out and listen to my presentation on dental hygiene in rural areas. And I think of health care, including dental care, is one of our most important aspects of our life. And in so many countries, even including Missoula, it is so hard to get sometimes. So it's great that you're here and you're learning from different people who have been out there and that you can maybe come together and help problem solve and figure out how to help these people with their health care and dental care. So first of all, I'd like to talk about my experience in Alaska. This just gives a little bit about what Peter said. But this was my first experience in public health. And I love this little thing. This is where I was in Bethel. OK, and it's 400 miles west of Anchorage. And this area is the yukon Kuskokwim Delta. And it's the largest delta in the world. And it's the size of um, Louisiana. And it's tundra and tundra. The six top layers of the um, soil are uh, either frozen or thawed, depending on the weather. Okay, so in the winter, it's great because everything freezes. The rivers freeze, the land freezes. And so then you can get out on your snow machines, your uh, four wheelers, and they dog sled also. And it's kind of coincidental, but Monday was the start of the Iditarod. And they start in Anchorage, actually. And then they go to Fairbanks. They get in their cars again and go to Fairbanks. And then they head up to uh, Nome. 
So that's kind of exciting. It, it happened on Monday, and you can go online and you can keep track of all the mushers, and it's kind of interesting. But um, and then in the summer, everything kind of turns mushy. There's no hiking. There's no walking on it because it's just mush. It's great for moose. Um, but the rivers, so you have the rivers that they take boats on and that kind of thing, and then there's always airplane travel. Um, and this is the, I love this, these are the roads. And look, there's no roads over here. So the whole area is, you just get around um, more in the winter with the snow machines and the um, four wheelers. And the rivers turn into roads and they drive trucks on them. So it's kind of interesting that there's no roads of getting around there. Okay, and this is a proof that everything is pure ice and snow and flat. And uh, we're ice fishing here. And I'm wearing something similar. This is a Gus Buck. Um, they wear these, uh, all the women do. And then these are supposed to be my mucklucks. But everything here they actually made, it's a, it's a beaver or a rabbit coat, and I have a wolf around the neck, and, um, and then a beaver hat. So, and the women, when they ice fish, it's nothing like when Jim here goes fishing. Uh, they don't catch like one or two fish, they catch this much fish, and they feel gunny sacks full of fish. It's pretty incredible. And um, the first time I went, um, here, we went back to the house and they went to the fish house and they filled this bowl up with fish and um, they just sit there and they grab pieces of fish and then they have their bowl of fish oil. And I was 25 and I just thought that was the most disgusting thing that they would take the fish and just dip it into this fish oil and eat it. And now, of course, we know how good fish oil is. So they are definitely ahead of the times. So. Other way, I'll figure. Let me see. Where am I going? Uh, both. And I just couldn't do the raw fish, and it's black, and it's these little teeny slimy fish, and they just, yeah, slurp it down. <coughs> it's it's just kind of a little bit gross. So here's just a little bit of history about the dental health in Alaska. So back in the 30s, the scientists proved that the uh, Native Americans there, the Eskimos, had the best teeth in the world, okay? They did not have sugar. They were all on this um, natural diet. But then Westerners came in, and in the 40s, sugar came in, and just a combination of things. They didn't have dentists. Um, they had low uh, employment, so they didn't have the money to fly to Anchorage or to Bethel to get care. So it, was, it turned into a, a disaster, and it's there's still, um, there's big improvements, but there's still a problem, but they're really working on it. But it's pretty sad that they were so good. Um, and then with sugar, with the Western diet. And here's a typical picture. This was one uh, given to me by one of the dentists that goes to the villages. And here's uh, an elderly, uh, Yupik Eskimo, and I'm sure he grew up on a native diet, and now he goes to the stores and is filled with processed sugary foods. And this is the hospital, okay, this is where I work part of the time. I didn't do much in a clinic, but I did have an office here, and there's a dental clinic, and there's like eight or nine dentists at the time, and they would work several weeks in this clinic, and then they would each have their own village, and they would go to the village for a couple weeks, a couple times a year. And they would, well, here's a picture of the clinic. These are some poster uh, winners that we got our picture in the paper for, but it's very modern at this hospital. Um, but here's a dentist, Fritz Kraft. He just sent me this picture Monday of him when he was back in the day. And they have all their gear right here that they take. Um, and then they, of course, fly to the villages. Um, but provided super good care. Um, now they have other ways of providing care, which is pretty exciting. Um, so to meet this massive amount of dental problems in Alaska, to provide a service that is the least um, 
cost effective and uh, meets the, the greatest reward comes down to water fluoridation. And so that is one of the things I did up in Alaska. And I would work with the water operators in the villages and they would send me their little samples every month and we would keep track um, of the levels. And if they did like six months of really good levels, I could call the chief and tell the chief, good job. And, and um, they'd put an award on the wall for the water operator. And so it was one way to um, keep the water fluoridation in the villages um, up to date. And this is in Bethel. And because the grounds are frozen, all the pipes are up, including water and sewer. And so you can't have anything in the ground. So it looks a little funny. Um, we used to call it the 8K Corral or something like that. Um, and it's actually hard to get underneath them. So there's just ways that you can weave yourself around there. Um, in the villages, they don't really have this kind of system. It's still honey buckets and dip water. Um, and that's what we had when I was living there is honey buckets. And then schools, I worked with a lot of the schools and this is in a village and they can't, there's no cars really. So they, you know, teenagers drive to the school with their four wheelers and their um, snow machines. And I would work with the community health workers and we would um, do presentations and we do weekly fluoride mouth rinses and that kind of thing. Schools are a great place up in Alaska to do any kind of education, health education. This is a building um, in Alaska. This is awesome. Awesome for the healthcare providers, maybe not for the pregnant women, but all the pregnant women in these 48 Eskimo villages on their ninth month of pregnancy, they have to fly to Bethel and they go into a home. And so you have this home with this uh, pregnant women that you can educate. And so for me, it was great. I would go in there um, once or twice a month and you could just talk to them about their own dental health. You could talk to them about their children's health. But now it's even more important because we know that getting a cavity is a bacterial contagious infection and you get it from your mother through saliva. So these little infants, um, if the mother is sharing saliva, which is super easy to do, you just lick a spoon, you check the temperature, you give it to the baby. So now you've shared that saliva and if they have a cavity, it's passed to the infants. Okay, so what a perfect place to have all these pregnant women there and you can provide that education. They also say that in the last month of pregnancy, it's super important to have a little bit of xylitol because then you lower your own bacterial count in your mouth. So if you have a low bacterial count in your mouth, you're gonna less likely pass it on to your children. If you never get the bacteria, you cannot get a cavity. And I know a lot of people don't know about that, but people all over the world do. This is xylitol from Thailand. My, my daughter brought this back, okay? So the Thais are all aware about xylitol. This is from Denmark, okay? And you can read the writing, it's Denmark. I can't read it, but it, I do see the xylitol, okay? This one is pretty cute. We got this when we were in Italy. It's called Xylitolo, okay? This one's from Germany. This one is very cool because it has fluoride and xylitol in a little gummy, okay? So these countries who are socialized, who provide free dental care for at least up until they're 18, they're really into prevention rather than trying to fix the problem. And xylitol is a natural way to do that. It comes from the xylan of the birch tree. So it's a natural sugar. And what happens is the bacteria that causes cavities, they love xylitol. It's their favorite. They love it more than molasses, honey, sugar. But they can't metabolize it. They can't use it for energy. And they starve to death. 
okay? So you can get it in toothpaste, uh, any uh, toothpaste at the good food store, they all have a little xylitol in it, so it's something that you want to look for, a little fluoride, a little xylitol. So you get the bacteria even before you have teeth. And so this is for kids, it's just a gel, and you would take some and you just rub it on their gums so that they don't get that bacteria starting to uh, colonize. Okay, and then here's a bunch of xylitol stuff products that are from the US. These are ice chips, you can come up afterwards and try some, they're all good. Comes in gum, they even make xylitol floss. They have, you've probably seen this in the stores, first ingredient xylitol. So I just have to give my little plug on that. But it's really important if you get them at a young age, infancy. Okay, and then here, I mean, you know, you can't help but see these cute kids brushing and they're so cute. And there's quite a few, um, they call them gussics, the, the Caucasian kids, and they're probably from teachers and other health workers. Okay, so what they have in Alaska, which is awesome, is they started this program for dental therapists, okay? And it started about 10 years ago. And where these dental therapists, well, what they did is they chose two qualified people who were interested in becoming a dental therapist from a village, okay? And they sent them to New Zealand. New Zealand's all over with this dental therapy and treating um, kids, um, they, uh, they're socialized, and so they have great dental care. So two um, native kids would go down to New Zealand, and they went to a two-year school. Then when they come back, they go back to their village, and they know the people, uh, the people know them, and they set up a little clinic, and this looks pretty modern, um, I'm not sure that they're always this modern. Um, and then they can do pretty much everything on kids. They do fillings, crowns, uh, root canals, extractions, um, anything that children would need when it comes to dental health, cleanings. And then they can do some uh, dental work on adults. They can do some fillings and some extractions. Um, we have in the lower 48 here, we have Minnesota, and we have Vermont, and of course Vermont, because that's where Bernie Sanders came from. So, um, and a dental therapist in those two states, you have to have a bachelor's in dental hygiene and then a two-year uh, dental therapy training. So it's a six year, it's a mid-level provider, and they do everything on children, they do, um, you know, limited amounts of procedures on adults, so it's a great, thing um, for people who can't get care. They're not taking away uh, services from the dentist, they're actually increasing the amount of people who are getting care. Because of course the American Dental Association is fighting the dental therapist and um, you just can't look at it like they're taking away the people that are seeing the dentist. It's adding more services to people in our community. So dental therapists are awesome. So let's see. So I spent a, a couple weeks in a village and this picture is just a, a little scene that I thought was kind of remarkable. So, um, you know, there's no running water, there's no flush toilets, it's honey buckets. And the father of the house comes in and we're just sitting there and he just whips out these minks out of his pack and he just turns them inside out and cleans them up and just sticks them behind his, um, the stove here and they're just sitting there drying. And um, it was just kind of a cool scene that here they are really subsistence and I'm not sure what they were doing with them, if they were gonna use them for a uh, coat or, or what, but it was, pretty shocking actually, mm -hmm. since there wasn't, oh, and then this is, I'll show really quick, this is when we had honey buckets, and here I am to show it. I had the cleanest honey bucket in town, and you would put your honey bucket out, and the honey bucket man would come, and he would take it, and he would empty it into honey bucket truck, and then the honey bucket truck would go out to honey bucket lake and dump them, and that's how it is. 
And then I met my husband in Alaska. He's from Massachusetts. He was, uh, works for Parks and Rec. And we decided to join the Peace Corps. And this is where we went, Jamaica. And you can see it's, there's Florida. You know, it's next to Haiti and Dominican um, Republic, and it's in the Caribbean. So uh, it's 150 miles across. It's 50 miles wide. Um, it has mountains and beaches. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Reggae. Maybe you've heard of reggae music. Bob Marley. Some of the things from there. And this is where we were greeted. And I had to put this in because the Peace Corps recently named Missoula the number one metro area for producing volunteers per capita in 2016. And I'm sure Peter is part of that recruitment. Well, I mean, the, the, we have a very high ratio of graduates from the University of Montana, but that's all of graduate people from Missoula. So that includes people who are going to other co colleges around the country and things like that. So it's really a, a testimony to the city more than to the university. Oh, okay. And maybe our group. <laughs> we, have, we have a group. When you join the Peace Corps, you come back to your town, and um, we have Chris and Jim, Melissa, no, oh, no, <laughs> um, a friend who's very active with us. And so um, we have a pretty large active group in Missoula, and it's very fun. And that is something to always be thinking about that you get support uh, when you get back, because it's kind of culture shock when you come back from a third world country. And in our group, I just want to show, show this because I know a lot of people are in health professions when they're here, but um, like she said, there are lots of other um, different professions. But in our group, there are 15, and we were mainly um, in the health profession. So from PE teachers, nutritionists, occupational therapists, a wide variety. So it was kind of fun to be around those. Okay, so the dental situation in Jamaica is they don't have these large city water um, facilities. So most people, they go to a well, they pump it in a bucket, and they carry it on their head, and they go home. Um, our particular house was hooked up to a small water facility, um, but none of them were fluoridated. It was just too costly, not effective, really, for the large population. So they ended up... Um, when, when we were there, um, they were working on salt fluoridation because the other countries surrounding them were using it, and now they do have their salt is fluoridated, and they also fluoridate their milk. So they have calcium and fluoride added to the milk. Milk is not as common um, to drink. It's a little expensive, but that is fluoridated, but everyone uses tons of salt. So they are getting some fluoride. Um, so the dentist situation is crazy. Like in 19 or 2012, they had 170 dentists. We have 80 dentists in Missoula. And this is like a country of millions of people. So there aren't very many dentists. And at the time, um, the dentists were all trained abroad, either in America or some other places, Grenada. And, and then they would come back and they would have to do their service and to the community and work in these public facilities, but not for very long. And then they could see that, ah, oh, this is not going to make it for me, and then they leave. So that's why there's so few there. But they just started a dental school in uh, Kingston. And so they're just now starting to get more dentists in the area. And they're going to have to really work on getting more. Um, when we were there, they had dental nurses. And dental nurses are awesome. They're trained in Kingston. It's a two-year training. And then the schools, not all of them, but most of them, would have these little dental clinics. And they would have the dental nurses working there. And the dental nurses would do all the fillings and extractions. And I don't think they did crowns, but they did the fillings. Um, they did not do cleanings. Um, but they provided that service right there at the school. It was awesome. But unfortunately, the dental nurse program, I just was emailing um, a dental nurse from Jamaica the other day. And it's they're closing down. And now all the dental nurses are retiring. 
and um, are going on to other things. So I think they're hoping that the dentists are going to do a lot more. And then they actually have a dental hygiene school. When I was there, I was the only dental hygienist on the island. Uh, so they didn't really know where to use me. I had to just kind of make up my own programs because they didn't know what a dental hygienist was. Um, but now they have a dental hygiene school, and so they're um, expanding on that. And they did the same thing as Alaska. They have these dental therapists who are just beginning to come to Jamaica. And they did send them down to New Zealand for their training, but now they actually have um, dental therapists uh, training right in Jamaica. So they're just kind of going through a, a stage, you know, trying to figure out how these professions are all going to be, do the best work for the people of Jamaica. Okay, so here are some of the uh, projects I did. I'm just going to talk about um, a fluoride weekly mouth rinse that I did and some sealants. And then I also <laughs> did quite a bit of education. And I did work in a clinic um, like three hours. Um, once a month, depending on when the market bus would come, and then I'd have to catch the market bus to get back to my village, so it was really impractical, but it was, it was fun to take the market bus to work. But, um, so, we decided at the school of 2000 in my town to do a weekly fluoride mouth rinse, and so we had to do it way different than anything that would be done here. So what we did is we had all the kids bring in money every day that they would collect. You couldn't have them wait to the end of the week because this counterpart of mine, she said that families would take the money. So she would sit here for a week and all the people would line up and they would bring in their quarters and their dollars and that kind of thing. And we actually raised, I don't know, 500, $700. It was quite a bit of money, enough for the program. And then at the end of the week, we had our walkathon. And so we walked all the way through to a different town. And so here we are, 2,000 kids, and they have signs, and they're so orderly, and I had to recruit some. There's another volunteer there. And we got teachers and parents to walk, and off we go. We walk all the way to a whole nother village. They don't call them villages, but another town. It was about five to seven miles. Here we are walking, and you can see how people are pretty orderly at this time. And, um, and here's some teachers. And this is why I didn't really want to wear Jamaican clothes, because they're just basic clothes. That's why I wore the alas and guspic. But here they are walking. And now it's getting a little more crazy. They're starting to run. We gave them um, <laughs> oranges and some water. And eventually, they all got back to the school. No one got hurt. No one got ran over. Um, but all the, the, all the parents and all the businesses, they all knew what was going on. It was kind of like a little advertisement for our big project. So that was fun. And we got a little press in the paper. So pretty fun. OK, so here we are at the mouth rinse. So here in uh, the United States, you get this little cup of fluoride in it, and you take it, and you sit at your desk, and you rinse, and you have a Kleenex, and you put it in the cup, and then you throw it away. Well, we couldn't really afford to have paper cups every single week for 2,000 kids. We couldn't afford the Kleenexes. And so we did permanent cups. And we have them outside because there's all these kids. You couldn't do it in the classroom because they're in desks like this, just shoved together. And there's like 60 in a classroom. I mean, you, you couldn't do it that way. So we have them line up outside. And we have a few people that are um, timers. Here they are washing the cups outside. It was a definite team effort from the students, the parents. Um, and the kids. Here they are inside filling them with a little fluoride. It's just a little teeny bit and um, washing some of the cups. There's a parent. And here they are again. I can't quite see. Lining up. They have the boys pretty much on the outside because they get, when boys get an opportunity to spit, they are all over it. <laughs> so we had to have boys in front and the girls in the back. Um, 
and they get their little cup and then they, here they are, cheers. And you see the woman in the back with her umbrella, a parent volunteer. Here I have with my, my sign to swish. And then you have the two students that are timing. Um, and they're so cute when they're swishing. Adorable. And then they swish. And they spit it right onto the ground. And that is the end of that. And then they go back and then another class comes. And it works. And it worked for a long time because look at there. There is a little blonde boy in there. And that is my son. And he's almost three. So here we are doing the same thing. Three years later, kept going. And look at this picture. Dylan is now eight years old. And he's got a really funny look on his face because he's got all these girls looking at him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the program went for about 10 years. And the teachers would say things like, oh, we hear less teeth problems from the kids. You know, you don't know if that's really true, but that's what they told me. And 9-11 um, came, and it just kind of shut everything down. I mean, it was just too hard to get you know, all the paperwork and the fluoride through, customs, it just not good. So it went for 10 years. And I'm just showing this picture because the gentleman there, he was the most um, dedicated parent volunteer and the principal, uh, the woman there, um, she was my counterpart for the entire time. She said that he said it was the most rewarding thing he's ever done, participated in. So that's really cool. He came every week and he kept time and kept everything going. So it was pretty cool that you can bring in the community to do all these different tasks. So that's cute. Uh, then the next thing I did was pit and fisher sealants, and I'm sure a lot of you kids have them. You usually get them when you're six years old. Um, it's a thin coating that you put over the tops of the colloidal surfaces of your first permanent molars in the back. Those molars come in without losing a tooth, so a lot of times parents don't even know they're there, and because of their pits, they usually get decay in them. Um, all mine are crowned or filled. You know, most people my age, they have fillings in those teeth. So if you can prevent those important uh, molars, um, if you can pre prevent them from getting decay, it's huge. So in America here, um, at the time, you had to get this done in a dental office. So I um, wrote to um, the companies and they were so happy. If you write Peace Corps project, they just will send you stuff. It's awesome. So they sent me all the stuff I needed. And this is a dental assistant that was another volunteer somewhere on the island, and she met me. This is a, 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 an abandoned house next to the school that they let us use. And so we went in here. These are all the kids we had to see. Some of them are a little small, but um, lots and lots of kids. Um, and of course, there were no sealants ever on any kids there. And so we used a table, um, just like a table like that. We put a sheet down and just used that for a dental chair. And the light was from the window. And we had to dry the teeth, and this is a a bulb syringe and so you just sit there and you dry it and you dry it and you dry it and then you had to you put the place the sealant and then you had to rinse it so we had another bulb with water and then we'd rinse it and then you have to suction it and we had some flying dentists that left us a shop back and that was that just saved us and so we were able to do these sealants on these kids and it, it worked great. And we have a little towel there for a pillow. And then when it came time to do the lower, you know, the upper, we just had them hang their head down. <laughs> and you know, these kids are beautiful and they never complain, never. And they um, were super amazing. Of course, back then we didn't wear gloves. I keep forgetting about that, that people might look at this and go, what? But. Um, we just didn't need to wear gloves back then. How long did it take for each kid? Well, probably like 10 or 15 minutes because of the process. 
You know, so not too long, really. We had a lot of kids. Oh, we had a lot of kids. It took so days, and days. days and days. And I had different people. I had the two dentists that were there. They came for a couple days each. Oh, yeah. It took a while. I have a lot of paperwork on that. And then this is so great. Afterward, you get this. They're like showing off their sealants. It's so cute. And we gave them a, a toothbrush and we had stickers that the company sent. So very cool. And then this is three years later. And it was almost impossible to find the kids because kids just go everywhere. So we were driving around the motorcycle and trying to find the kids. And it's amazing. They would see the name and they go, oh, yeah, that's, she's up in this school now and this one's up here. But we got about half the kids and about half the sealants were there on. So it was pretty good results considering the situation. So it was pretty fun. And then here is just lots of dental educations. They have all kinds of health fairs and um, just educational, uh, you know, these kind of things where this is, I think, sponsored by, it says, I see a sponsor. It was probably sponsored by Colgate. Colgate was huge there. And they, um, they, people would see the billboards for Colgate and I don't think they even realized you needed a toothbrush and they would put the toothpaste on their fingers and just rub it thinking that was good. So, I mean, Colgate was great. They could give you some money, but the, they just didn't have any education along with it. And since they never had any education, they were so great. I could just walk in anywhere and people were just super interested. So here we are talking about tea, I mean, toothbrushing and here's this little girl on dental flossing, so cute. They were just so interested in it. And they have beautiful teeth. And then I have to show this because um, several times we'd be driving around and you'd see people on the side of the road and they'd be using a chew stick. And when you peel it back, it actually foams. And I always thought they'd put toothpaste on it, but it, it actually foams up and it's anti-karyogenic and antibacterial. And so these students um, from the school, they made these little posters, which is really cute. And, and this one is all foamy. It's pretty cute. And it's a vine and it has fluoride in it. There's fluoride in the chew stick. So they would take it and they would cut these little pieces and you can buy them in the market. And then they just kind of fray the end and it's kind of bitter but you just take it around and it's, it's awesome. It's interesting, they do that in uh, West Africa as well. Yeah, they had the same thing and I had, someone went to Africa and brought me some, some back and I don't know if it's the same bush, but maybe if it's the, sure. yeah. Pretty cool though, I mean, it's actually a natural thing in their country that's um, beneficial. So, what else we got? And then my husband worked with these nurses um, community health workers and a big problem they have there is running belly which is diarrhea and lots of kids actually die from it um, and so it was really important to teach the public um, about these oral rehydration fluids and I'm sure that's all over the world too oral rehydration fluids and it's just these packets and you have to put them in the water and shake it up and you give it to the the babies and it helps a lot and, I mean, any time you bring in dance and music, you have great education. They just suck it up. And they actually make songs about teeth and brushing, and it's awesome. And this is a, a health science fair that my husband put on, and they made, um, this was a dental, a dental song. So cute. It was awesome. These are a couple other volunteers. This little scene is pretty crazy where we were at his house and uh, people were kind of lingering out kind of by the street a little bit. And then he's got this bench at his house <laughs> and people would just come in and he would just come on over. He would just grab his dental tool and have him sit down and uh, nowadays we have these glasses that are magnifiers and you have a light, but back then we didn't. So he has no light 
and no anesthetic, and he extracts teeth just like this. And people know what they're getting into. They never complain. You know, they bring their own uh, gauze, kind of their towels, and out comes the tooth. And then these are two other um, uh, volunteers, and they're doing environmental health. They had a, a health fair, so. And now this is a little interesting. If you see that, this is Missoulian, January 17, 1985. That's when we were in Jamaica. Okay, Jamaica unrest continues. So in Jamaica, we had no phones. There was one in the entire town. And you would have to stand in line. So I called home three times, the whole two years. So there was really no communication other than we wrote letters once a week. So my mom reads this. And she reads the whole thing. And so she calls the Peace Corps office in Washington. And she goes, you know, there's this article about this unrest in Jamaica. And my daughter and son-in-law are there. Should I be concerned? And the lady um, goes, just a second. And she comes back and she says, yes. So my poor mom is freaked out because, you know, this is going on. And what it was is that the government overnight raised gas prices from 10 to $12. I mean, that's kind of a good reason to kind of have a little unrest. I mean, it's, they're so expensive to begin with. And then you go from 10 to 12. I mean, come on, give me a break. But here's what we were doing. Here I am. And this is one of the kids in the neighborhood. And here's another kid from the neighborhood. And these are some of the teachers. And this is just a little ways from our house. And so all the Peace Corps volunteers had a week off. And it was so much fun because we went exploring. We went and found some caves and um, all kinds of fun. We had a great time. So I'm just telling you this, that sometimes when you read things in the paper about what's happening in the world, that it's not maybe exactly the way it is. It, you know, I mean, you have to be, you have to be careful, of course, but um, yeah, it just, it might be exploded more than it really is. And then something that's really good, um, besides just living in another country, is the food. And someone, Connor, I think, uh, the jackfruit at Safeway. And so this jackfruit, which is painted over there, um, is huge, and it, like this, and it hangs from a tree. But there's all these other great fruits that, you know, I want to say that you would never get here, but my husband just told me there was a piece of jackfruit at Rosar's. And then Connor just told me there was a piece of jackfruit at Safeway. And they have it at Albertsons. So, um, but you want it fresh, right? <laughs> so head to a, a third world country or a foreign country and get fresh, delicious fruit. Uh, and this is my last photo. And I have to tell it because um, that's my son. He's 30 now. But whenever I would show this picture of him for years and years and years, he would always say, I'm the one holding the puppy. <laughs> and he would never use a skin color or complexion to describe who he was. Um, he just didn't even see it. And so I think when people are out in the in the world and going to different countries that complexion doesn't mean anything. You just realize that people are people and that um, we all are here kind of for the same reasons and, and they loved him and Dylan loved them. And it's, I think it's just so good for people to get out there and see other people in the world and, and learn from them and share what you have and, and then come back. That's one of the Peace Corps goals. You come back and you um, share what you've what you've learned. So that's Great job it. To end on. Let's give uh, Heidi a round of applause. Okay, we've got lots of time for questions. I've got quite a few, but I'll wait until I hear from you guys first.
Hey, yeah. um, so I'm actually interested. I want to go to dental school, but I like. I'm also Native American. You kind of alluded earlier to talking about Alaskan natives. Oh yeah. And I don't know like how much like Native American people you work with and stuff. I just wonder, like, do you notice like a difference in Native American oral health care, I guess, compared to other ethnicities? Like, I feel like ours is a lot more poor. We kind of believe the fact that it's like it hasn't been that long. I feel like these like sugars and all these diets have been introduced into our into our culture, kind of. And before that, we were just like living off like vegetables exactly. and, and stuff. So I was wondering, I'd be like, I don't, like I said, I don't know how much you work with Native Americans, but do you feel like that follows, whole, feel like that we are a little bit below the standard? Well, that's the s statistics. But I look at my own self, if you don't get dental care, um, like I would probably have no teeth, I'd be toothless. So the problem with those villages and um, even in Bethel is there just isn't the care. You get what I'm saying? There's just no, um, like even here in Missoula, I mean they have the Missoula Urban Indian Health Center, we're trying to get a dental clinic, we're almost there, we have a lot of it. Um, it's just trying to get the people um, access to care is mainly, the, I think, the main thing. Um, they never had dentists there. So now with these dental therapists up in Alaska, I mean, it's going to be awesome because they're the, they're the people that live there. And they take two a year. I know that doesn't seem much, but they've been doing that for the last 10 years. So it's going to start meeting the needs. But I believe that, I mean, in Caucasians, you guys, are any of you Caucasians? Like, do you have dental fillings? Do most of you have fillings? And yeah, so we've just gotten care that we've had the access to care. We've been able to afford it. We've been, you know, trained in that way. I think back in the day, they didn't get cavities. Like my first slide, 1930s, they had the most pristine teeth ever. Um, I did work on some older women and they didn't have any cavities, and but their teeth were flat from chewing, but no cavities. And then the sugar comes in and they didn't have a dentist. They didn't have any of these things and it just has gone rampant. Because remember, it's a bacterial infection, so it's just gonna spread. So. Um, I, mean, I guess like, I feel like a lot of my like, Caucasian friends, I guess like, they don't brush their teeth, like some people don't brush their teeth like that much and they just never get cavities, but I feel like in the Americans, like you can have people who brush like two or three times, floss and everything, and they still like can get That's so cool that you're saying that because this is all about xylitol. Yes, if you don't get the bacteria, you can't get cavities. And I see them in my office. They come in, they're like 35 and I, they never had a cavity. And I'm like, well, do you eat sugar? You know, do you not eat sugar? And they go, oh, I'm a sugaraholic. They can, they can eat as much sugar as they want if you don't get the bacteria. If you're in a population that has a lot of cavities, it's all gonna be spread because it's bacterial, it's spread. Little children, they lick pencils, they lick pencils and then pass it to the next, they lick pencils, they're just spreading that. We just have to, we don't know that information, so we have to get that in our head. It's a back, contagious, bacterial infection. So when you work, since you're working at the Indian Health Center, do you preach to like parents and stuff about xylitol? Well, I do the two health fairs. There's one in the spring, one in the fall. And I go there and yes, we talk about all that. I have my own little, my little, you know, set up and we talk about that. But, you know, it's a lot of people, a lot of people got to be educated. We need billboards. We need you to become a dental therapist. Any other? Oh. What would your advice be to somebody that wants to work in a developing situation while raising a family? Um, go for it. I, I guess I don't know your question. I mean, um, like. Some people might be scared of that situation or have pre assumed fears about trying to raise a family in a third world country. What would you say to them about your experiences to encourage them to pursue that? It's amazing. In the Peace Corps now, when you go, you can't have children. I actually got pregnant when I was down there. Um, so I, we wanted to extend another year, and they sent us home. Um, so they don't, the Peace Corps in itself. I guess it depends on the country. We know some people that did have their children down there, but there's lots of missionaries that have families there that raise them, um, teachers. 
that have families. Um, we took our kids down when they were little. Um, I guess it depends maybe on the country, you know, like you're thinking of health issues maybe. But I mean, to be incorporated with the kids, I mean, how cool is that? My, my kids, every time we go down, they love it. They always attach to a friend and it's really cool experience. Um, like, I don't know if they were of age to be like going to school while they were down there, but like, did you, like with the education systems in different places, like sometimes I guess the fear is that it's not as rigorous or that, you know, the education system isn't going to prepare them for life. So, like, would you combine that with, like, well, these are the things that I've learned and I can supplement your education or, I mean, even just, like, working on it? Yeah, I mean, you could do that, but in all, most countries, I don't know what the other volunteers would say, but, like, there's the private schools mm -hmm. and then there's the state schools, kind of like, kind of like here, I guess. Um, some of the state schools, they produced very well-educated people. In Jamaica, it's the British system, so it's the A's and the O's, and they actually take their tests and they're actually sent to uh, England to be corrected. Um, but some of those people, they, you know, they become doctors and attorneys and businessmen and women. And um, so I guess it depends, like, I would think that um, you would get a great education. Um, some of the Jamaicans uh, would have to, if they come from a very low economic status, it's really hard to come up. They just don't have the opportunities. Every Friday they have to go help cut the pig and get it ready for market and things like that. But um, families that have you know, maybe work in a store or something, then they get the regular schooling and they study hard. So, I mean, some of the kids don't even know their ABCs and they're 30, but most of the kids that go to school and can go to school, I think they get a pretty good education. Hi. I what your thoughts are, Heidi, on like oral irrigators like dental pick, hydrofloss, uh, what your thoughts are on use? Well, those are all, those are all great. What is your name? I remember you. Kaziah. Yes, right. yeah. Um, yeah, so those are all great, but those are just hard things in third world countries. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But they're all awesome. And my question has to do with the uh, dental therapists, the dental nurses. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, I think that we talk a lot about uh, the idea of, uh, of scaling up, that uh, there are oftentimes semi-professionals who can do the work of, uh, of people that take a, have a lot more training but who may not stay in a country. And I think you gave a good example of that, in, ca in fact, in the case of the Jamaicans who, who came back and worked as dental nurses, which they don't, which you don't have any longer there. So I have a two-part question. What's the difference between a dental therapist and a dental nurse? That's the first part of the question. And the second is, did you spend any time training, you know, recognizing that they had studied abroad as well, but did you spend any time filling in for them in terms of training while you were there? Because that would have a more sustainable impact, I think. Yeah, you know, at the time there were only dental nurses when I was there, and they were in Kingston, and they did a, they did, uh, their procedures were way different than mine. Mine was educational and, uh, you know, dental hygiene, preventive. Theirs was more the fillings, extractions, two different procedures. So they didn't procedures. do any, any preventive education kind. Of no. Um, you wouldn't want them to. I looked at one of their instruments one time, and it was a hook like that. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want that to be cleaning your teeth. <laughs> um, no, they didn't do any cleanings. It was mainly just fixing decay. Yeah, so that's the dental nurse, which is really important to do that. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when I was emailing to this dental therapist, um, in Jamaica just Tuesday, she, she isn't sure why they are getting rid of the dental nurse program. It's all in limbo now that they have this dental school there and the dentists are trying to take a little bit more power. So I think they're just 
sounds like they're in transition of trying to figure out all these different professions because there's three levels of like dental hygienists. There's dental hygienists with a two year and then the dental hygienist with expanded functions and a dental hygienist that's a therapist. So that doesn't really answer your question, but I don't think they, they're just trying to work it out. But here, um, here in America, you can be a dental assistant and a dental assistant is anyone. Anyone here could be a dental assistant. You just, there's no formal training, there's no licensure, there's no nothing. And so some of the dental assistants are working with a dental hygienist and they go into schools. They went to Bonner, they've gone to DeSmet, um, different uh, schools and they put down cots all over in the gym and they lay all the kids out and they can do, they go from kid to kid to kid and do these sealants. That is public health right here in Missoula. And that requires no real education other than you gotta have someone, a dentist or a dental hygienist there. So it's kind of a mass public health thing. And unfortunately, they only, they call it success if 30% of those sealants are um, there within six months. So it's not really, you know, it'd be better if there was like 60% of the seedlings were there. But anyway, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. It's just getting going. Maybe, you know, Jane Gillette, Dr. Gillette, she's doing that. She has her whole program and she goes all around the state and does these sealant programs. Question. Um, so you're like talking, you alluded to the fact that your like big message while you're in Jamaica was like prevention and more or less like prevention techniques within kids. I was wondering if you, like, did you work with adults at all while you were over there? And if so, like, did you, like, what was your observations, I guess, like, did they have, were cavities prevalent in their culture, or, like, were just getting their teeth pulled a lot, or what were your, like, your observations, I guess, from that? Yeah, I didn't really see too many adults, but in the clinic, I would see them. Probably 50-50 had good teeth. I don't think people came, actually, to see me if they had bad teeth. Um, but... There are a lot of sad things there. I mean, like young teenage girls with their front teeth missing, a um, lot of people with their front teeth missing, uh, adults, teenagers, you know, just lack of care. I mean, just lack of like getting dental care. Um, you know, I seriously would be in dentures if I did not have uh, dental care at a young age. I have like four root canals. I could eat, I have a flipper. I'm missing my front tooth. <laughs> I am missing my front tooth. I'm getting an implant here in a couple weeks. So um, I'm sure my mother gave me the bacteria on day two. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, this has been a really very interesting, and I, I think you know we have a lot to be thankful for for the work that Heidi's done, both in the Peace Corps and uh, subsequently. Um, which is you know one of the main reasons why we have this lecture series, so that we get a chance to showcase uh, the people in Missoula who do these amazing things around the world. So please join me in giving Heidi a round. Of applause. <laughs>